Amen. Well, I'm going to go ahead and light these, some of the candles that we've started lighting. We've started this Advent series, which is the first time we've done this, like Martin said, at our church in the 10 years of our church. Uh, we started the, service, the series on hope, and we recognize that Christ brings hope to the city, to the world, that he is our source of hope in every situation. We've recognized that Scranton needs hope. That's why on our t-shirts even, and all of our branding, that we are here to bring hope to the city. Too many areas of brokenness and confusion stem from a lack of hope the drug addiction issues in the city the 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 broken politics and corruption there's a there's a hopelessness that has caused people to break to break out into other areas to fill that void and we believe that Christ is our hope and we look at peace that he is the giver of peace in our lives that true peace isn't circumstantial it's based in him and then last week Ben lit the pink candle signifying joy, that our joy is centered in him. And this morning, we're going to look at one final aspect before this Thursday, we light the Christ candle, recognizing that he is the one that holds it all together. Um, before I do, I Jonathan Walter asked me a question. It was more of a riddle the other night. We were talking, and he gave me a riddle. And I'm going to give you that riddle right now and see if you can solve this riddle. He asked me, what has 14 actors... Four settings, two writers, and one plot. And I thought, as a guy who, I wanted to be in Hollywood before I felt the call to ministry. I'm like, I should get this. And I'm racking my brain through all the great movies. And I'm thinking, is it the James Bond series? Like, what is he talking about here? Um, does anybody know the answer? 14 actors, four settings, two, two writers, and one plot. Did I get it right, Jonathan? He said close enough. You got it. Anybody know? Hallmark movies. Think about it. That was his joke slash riddle for me. Hallmark movies. It's the same plot. Might change it up with the two different writers, a couple different settings. You, you, you know what you're going to look for when you turn on Hallmark, right? And maybe you guys haven't watched Hallmark. I watch a lot of it because my wife loves it. Loves it, right? And Christmas time is like... It is the holy season of Hallmark. Like, you just, they, they start brand new Christmas movies starting before Thanksgiving even comes around. They, they're cranking them out, and you know if it's Saturday night, Sunday night, sometimes even on a Tuesday night, there is a brand new Hallmark Christmas movie. You think of the word Christmas and put anything else in it, you got a title for a Hallmark movie. And I was thinking about this. I've, I've seen way too many, and I could name way too many of the actors, and I know where the story's going. About five minutes into the movie, I know which one of the paths they're about to take with this thing. But my wife loves it, and I've found myself like kind of sucked into that world. Like sometimes she'll go into another room and start doing something around the house, and I'll still be sitting there watching this Hallmark movie. I'm just sucked into it, even though I know what's going to happen, and I would never intentionally put it on myself. Like, because I'm, I'm above that. I'm beyond that, right? But I was thinking about it. I'm like, there's something unique about this market that they are pushing and doing really, really well with. There is a constant pursuit of love at Christmas time. All these characters are looking for love made right, fixed, that broken relationship or that long lost boyfriend from back in high school. You know what I'm talking about? There's something that they're longing for like love to be fixed that they're not finding it at their current job. Like job, they got their boss is putting too much pressure on them. And so they decide to go home for the holidays because they got to think about work situations or their fiance is just a complete dud who's sucked into his work environment and they've got to go home and think Think about it, right? Because they're looking to fix that love void during Christmas. And so Christmas is often paired with this desire to be with the one you love, to feel loved, to, to be loved, right? But if you're not in that relationship or worldview, Christmas can also be a time where it's filled with depression and frustration because you don't feel loved. I remember um, I was just out of high school. And Ashley and I, if you don't know her story, we dated for three months, and she broke my heart, right? Give me, come on, give me a good awe. Nobody, I gotta, ben laughed in the corner. <laughs> this is what I go through, right? And, and I remember that first Christmas, 
after Ashley and I broke up and my sister was dating her boyfriend and my parents are happily married and there I am sitting on the couch by myself at Christmas. I hated Christmas. I became Ebenezer Scrooge and the Grinch for three years during Christmas time. I love Christmas, always did, except for when I realized I didn't have that somebody, right? And I understand that's the hallmark market. You gotta have that somebody to make you feel love during that time or it's all garbage, right? I wanna encourage you and challenge our worldview this morning that, that love is not about feeling. Love is not a, just an emotion. Love demands action. And during Christmas, we see that we have received the greatest action of love ever given that we could ever know and receive. And in this time, we should focus on the reality that we have already received love given to us. Okay, we're going to look at that this morning. First John, or John, his gospel is very different. I love the gospel of John. And if you're looking for something to read this week going up into Christmas, I would encourage you this morning, read the book of John. But it's not like the other nativity stories. Luke gives us these great stories of shepherds and wise men and 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 this beautiful manger scene, right? And, and Matthew gives us this genealogy, this leading up to Christ, right? Mark kind of jumps into it pretty quickly as well. But he gives us a little bit of the birth story. John doesn't do that for us. What John does is he starts off with this very poetic and very true language. He says that in the beginning was the word, and the word was made flesh, and the word was God. Be, you, guys know, you guys know that. The word was made flesh, and it dwelt among us. John chapter 1 and 2. And so it's a very interesting start because it actually starts talking about John the Baptist then and how he was the one revealing Jesus. Jesus has come, the word made flesh, the light of the world giving life to men, and John has come to talk about it. And then next thing you know, we see Jesus is on the scene as an adult getting baptized. So it's not much of a nativity story there. But in chapter 3, I would say we get this well-known nativity verse that Most of us know and recognize, we should know and recognize, but I would say it is the story of Christmas wrapped up into a sentence. In chapter 3, we see Jesus is having a dialogue with a Pharisee, a religious leader who recognizes that Jesus is something special. He says, I know that you were sent from God. Give me some information here because I'm confused. And Jesus says, you got to be born again. And, and, and he, Nicodemus is confused by this. What do you mean born again? You can't, you, that's, that's, that's physically impossible. And Jesus begins to talk about this new birth of the Spirit. And then he says these words, John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is Christmas wrapped up into a verse, that God has so loved us, the entire world, he's loved us so much that it propelled him to action, and that action was to send God in the flesh through Jesus, his son, on the earth to die in our place so that we could all have life. That's the story of the gospel. It wasn't to send the son to judge the world. It wasn't to send the son to, to make all the problems go away by destroying all the wicked ones. It was to reconcile the world to himself. It was God loved us so much that he took action. Does that make sense? That's the Christmas story. God loved, so therefore he acted. Love is not just an emotion or a feeling. God doesn't just love you in his God heart where he has good feelings toward you. God loved you in his God heart to where he demonstrated love by doing something about it. You were separated. You were in sin. You were dead to him, is what scripture says. We were dead in our sins. It's like God looked at you and said, you're dead to me, but God loved you so much, he said, I'm going to fix that. I'm going to fix that. I'm going to send my son to die in your place. Does this make sense this morning? This is the story of Christmas. God loved us enough that he took action, and our whole faith revolves around this fact. We're going to stick with the theme of John this morning. We're going to kind of hop through some of the writings that John has given us. And John, 1 John, so it's another book written by John, chapter 4, verse 16 through 19 says this, God is love. We talk about this a lot at church. This is a key moment in my life when I recognized that God doesn't have love, he is love. God doesn't possess love or feel love, he is love. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. 
by this love is perfected in, with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because he is also, he is, uh, he is so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. I want you to see in that passage that, that our relationship with God, our connection to him, is connected to our understanding of his love for us. It says this, when you think about judgment, we typically think, hey, if I said to Andy, come over to my house tonight because I want to show you my judgment, you're probably not going to come, right? You're going to be, oh, I'm going to pass on that. Like, I'll, I'll skip that. But here's the judgment of God, right? I send my son not to condemn you but to save you. And here's my judgment. I, I, I give you my perfect love, and where my perfect love is, you have no fear. I, I want to read this again. There is no fear. This is verse 18. We'll, we'll go back to 17. By this love is perfected in us, right? Walk with me here. So that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in the world. So if God is love, so are we in love. That's, that's because we abide in him, right? If he is love, we now walk in love. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. What he's saying is my judgment isn't about punishment. My judgment is about pouring out my mercy and my grace on you. And when you understand that, you become as I am on the world, in the world. As he is, so are we. He is love. It says it in the same verse. So we have to understand and grow in a confidence of love, knowing that my position in him, the day of judgment that I stand in front of God, isn't about him beating me, it's about he has already taken the punishment because of his great love was manifest in the person of Jesus. Make sense? That's what this is about. So my relationship with God is connected to my understanding of his love for us. We're not afraid of God because he has invited us into relationship by being true love. So I step into relationship. My fear of God isn't I, I run and hide because I don't know what he's going to do. My fear of God is you are so beautiful and magnificent and beyond all this. What can I do to serve you in your kingdom? Does it make sense? It's a changing. It's a, it's a, it's a renewing. It's a love being perfected in us. John 15, Jesus says these words in verse 13. Greater love has no one than this that someone lay down his life for his friends. Jesus is setting the stage here. Guys, look what I'm about to do. You won't see a greater act of love in your life than what I'm about to do is what he's saying. You'll never experience it. And so if you today, watching online or here in the building, are in the season and you're just struggling with like a lack of feeling love, or understanding your value, knowing your worth, let me remind you that Jesus has said, you will never experience a greater love than what I've already shown you on the cross. Not, no gift that somebody gives you, no act of kindness or compassion, no service, no, nothing that somebody does for you will outdo what Jesus has already done by laying his life down for you. He says, I love you so much. God says, I love you so much that this is what I've done this is who I am. This is how I, how I relate to you in this position. 1 John chapter 4. You guys still good this morning? Verses 7 through 12. Like I said, we're going to take a, a ride through some of the John stuff here. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. So if you know God which we just talked about before, then you love. It's just a part of, it's the byproduct, it's the gift, it's the, the natural existence of knowing who God is. You love others then. Because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this, this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he has loved and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God if we love one another. 
God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. See, I want you to see that. Verse 9, in this, the love of God was made manifest that he sent his son. Christmas is about God saying, I love you. I love you. I'm sending my son. And I, I, can't, I can't say it any louder. I can't do any more acts. I can't do anything other than sending my son to die in your place. That is my greatest statement of love for you. And then John reminds us that because we have seen this, because we've experienced love, love is evident, it's in the action of his coming, we now love others because we've experienced and known his love in action. Let me take a, a moment here to kind of go off path for a second. My wife and I were talking, um, some, some people in her life made some statements about politics and the world and what the church needs to do and how we need to fix this with elections and blah, 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 right? And I, and I, I'm at risk of offending people this morning. I'm sure I want to be, okay, I heard one person say do it. So in this church, one's a, man, a majority, so we're going to do it. No. Um, I said this, I said that, Listen to me, and this is not, like I said earlier, we speak words of life, not words of death, but I, I want you to hear a, an honest observation that I made. We've already lost the battle with abortion and marriage issues. The church has. And it's not because we voted the wrong way. We've had plenty of Republican, Christian people in office. The church has lost the battle on key issues because we haven't learned to show love to the world. When we've seen sin, we figure we've got to make new policies and new laws to fix sin. And Jesus has said, come and to the religious said, it's not about your laws or your policies. It's about you understanding love and grace and mercy. Jesus looks at the woman caught in the act of adultery who is condemned by the law. And he says, I don't condemn you. Go sin no more. Jesus looks at the church and says, the world will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. I'm reading this great book the patient ferment of the early church is talking about how the early church grew because it didn't make any logical sense. How the early church was persecuted so badly, so mocked, how they grew. You know how they grew? Because they were patient with loving each other and looking like Jesus every day. That when the world mocked, persecuted, and sinned, they responded with grace and blessing and mercy. Do you understand this? We've received the greatest act when he should have condemned us all, when he had every right to bury this earth and start fresh. He says, I love you so much that I'm giving you my son, and now what I want you to do with my son is give that same thing to the world. When the world shows sin, you show grace. When the world shows condemnation and death and persecution, you show mercy. Does this make sense this morning? This is in the scripture. This is how I know it in my heart. Jesus says, this is what it looks like. Love is from God and love is what, this is what it looks like. That you show it to everybody else because you have received it from God who is seated in heaven, ruling and reigning. He has every right to do whatever he wants to us. And he says, I give you my grace, my mercy. I give you my son. John 13, Jesus says this, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. He doesn't say, disciples, if you do all these crazy wild signs and wonders, or if you get your theology right and teach all the law, and if you figure it all out and you have every answer to every question, or if you build all these great ministries for the homeless or for the poor, or if you, if you have the greatest schools or the biggest churches, he doesn't say any of that. If you get your select guy in office, then the world will know that you are my disciples. He doesn't say that. What does he say? If you love the way I loved you, that's how the, 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 everybody will know you're mine. You guys feel this this morning? Like I, like I'm not trying to be like one way or the other about the elections or politics. I'm for good policies. I am for a lot of things. If you know me, I'm conservative in a lot of ways. But it's not about that. We live in a broken world that needs to encounter God's love. And God's love isn't about judgment. God's judgment is reconciliation. His justice is fixing things. That's what it's about. I see that in scripture. 
One last verse. 1 John chapter 3, verse 18. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. This morning, I want you to understand that love is not just an emotion that we should feel, especially during the Christmas time as we sit in our homes with family and we watch our kids open up gifts that, that make them smile for 15 minutes until they start playing with the box and then we throw out the toy and keep the box, right? Love isn't about having that special someone to sip hot cocoa with by the fire and get under a mistletoe with. Love is not about that perfect hallmark ending to your story. Love is is about God forgiving us and demonstrating his great love toward us. And then we know that love and we give that love. I have love in this Christmas time, not based on the fact that I have a great wife and three awesome kids. I have love in this Christmas time, not because I have a great church family or great friends. I have love in this Christmas time because God has sent Jesus for me, for you. Love is action. And as much as I joke about Hallmark, even Hallmark gets that fact. Every great Hallmark movie with that one plot has the same twist. That person's newly kindled love and three days stuck in the snow. They just found the love of their life. <clears throat> Can't make it home. That love that they've found requires an action. That guy or that girl has to forsake that great career in the city to go work at the bookstore or the tree farm or the little shop on Main Street. They've got to forsake that big life that they dreamed of for true love, right? There's a sacrificial action. Even they get a glimpse of that. There's a great book when I do marriage counseling. I talk about this book with a lot of the people that I counsel. It's called Five Love Languages, right? There's five love languages that they, they point out because it takes love as an emotion and breaks it down to actual actions, common actions that reveal or display love in our families and our way of life. There's words of affirmation. You have to speak it. You have to acts of service, do something for somebody. There's gifts. You have to buy or give something. The greatest gift that the world will ever know is what? Jesus Christ. Quality time, being with, spending time. Jesus came, the Son of God, came as a baby and then lived 33 years on the earth with humanity. He's like, I'm going to invest my time with you. Physical touch is another one that says, I'm here for you. Let me, let me show you my affection. Let me show you my embrace that I care for you. I love that Jesus is walking on his way to heal somebody and somebody touches his robe and he's like, who touched me? Jesus lets the kids come and sit on his lap and be near him. There's, Jesus was the one who was always in action with his love. This morning as we go into Christmas, I want to light this love candle recognizing that love has been, perfect love has already come to the earth in the person of Jesus. And this morning, you need to know that love has taken action on your behalf already through, through Christ. And if that is so, if you receive that love, if you know that love, if you come to an awareness of it, if you abide in that, then the byproduct of that should be true love given to those around us and not just in word, but also in action. Does that make sense? I love this great quote from Martin Luther King Jr. Love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. What does Jesus say about love? Anybody can love their friend. We have to love our enemies. Well, how does your enemy know that you love them? Right? They can't feel your emotions. You have to do something. It's an action. This morning, this week, I want to encourage you to, one, receive the action already done in your life, Jesus Christ. Know that you are loved, and you will never in your life find a greater expression, manifestation of love than what he's already done. But 
in this season as well, as you know that love and receive it, you must take love as a concept and turn it into an action. You can't just say you love others and you love God and then not do something about it. Who are the people in your life that you need to manifest love to in some way? Who are the people you need to forgive? Who are the enemies in your world that you need to walk in reconciliation with? Why should you do that? Because God did that. And that's what love looks like. Worship team, would you come forward? This morning, if you are here with us in person or if you're watching online, let me challenge you. Let me speak to you. I had this image just pop into my head. I don't know what's happening behind me. I saw giggling. It's probably Eric. But I had this image pop into my head of the Grinch and Who, Whoville. You guys know what I'm talking about? Whoville, right? A little da who, do re da who. That's all singing. I don't even know. What, what does that mean? Is that just made up words, right? I know da who, do re, and I don't know who do re is, or any, I don't know anything what that song's about. But for just for a moment, I had that image of this grinchy, woe is me, heart. And a town full of people who seem to have it all. And when he takes it all, they still are hanging on to love even for their enemy, right? That's where transformation takes place. That's why we have a good Christmas movie in The Grinch, because there's a transformation that takes place. If Grinch remained The Grinch, that movie would be terrible, right? (laughs) Why? Because it cries out for the heart of the gospel. It speaks echoes of of what Jesus has done for us. It finds that God-shaped hole in here and says, we all long for reconciliation and love that goes beyond Christmas hams and turkeys and whatever crazy toys they had, kerfunkles and bamboozles or something. I don't know. It goes beyond all that stuff. It goes beyond your Amazon wish list. It goes beyond hot cocoa. It goes beyond, right? If you're watching online, I want you to know that God has shown you already his love and he took action. God loves you so much that he asks that you would love others, including your enemies this week. Let love work and turn your enemies into friends of God. Let it work. Let it be at work in you. Let, don't let love be a, a Christmas feeling. Love is not just a feeling, but find ways to let love at Christmas time be words and actions. I don't know what that means for you, but you do. Figure out ways to let love be an action in your life because God took action through love for you. Go beyond Hallmark Christmas. Go beyond the need for the perfect gift or the part of your relationship. And I want to challenge you if you're hurting, if you're broken, if you need love, find love in the life and the work of Christ. Because that's that's the perfect place for it. That's the ultimate place for it. Let's worship together.